let's kick this one off with age. And um, just one case on age discrimination that I thought was um, a, an interesting one, as a reminder that um, the Equality Act covers all age groups in terms of its protection. And this is the case of Cassidy, um, Hazel Cassidy, who's only 14 years old and uh, worked for a cafe um, as a Saturday job. And she did um, her first shift and was told she was doing great. And then after her second shift, when she was told you know, not to do various things, she was then um, called at the end of the day and told not to come back. It was nothing she'd done, but they decided she was too young for the job um, and that it would be a breach of health and safety to continue to employ her in their own view. So Miss Cassidy brought an age discrimination claim against the um, owner of the cafe, Daimler Foundation. Um, and the judge preferred the evidence of the claimant, um, saying that she gave her evidence as, albeit a 14-year-old, clearly, candidly, calmly, and for someone who was so young, um, very, very credible and reliable as a witness. And so she was awarded just shy of £3,000 after doing only one and a half Saturday shifts. <laughs> OK, so sex discrimination next. Um, and, and again, important um, looking at sex discrimination, just exactly as we talked about earlier on today, was the childcare disparity. And the childcare disparity is basically the concept that women still have the greater burden of childcare responsibility than men, according to statistics. And although over time this is, of course, shifting to be slightly more balanced, it is of judicial note, and that's something that a lot of cases have now become quite fashionable to include, or should I say should include, because that's what judges need to do. They need to tell us how they take notice of various statistics, such that they don't require documentary and witness evidence from um, the parties at a particular tribunal hearing, because it's just known. So judicial notice is where something is just known, and it is just known that there remains a childcare disparity, according to statistical evidence, that the, judge, the judges across the land accept in the courts. And in this particular case, Dobson worked for North um, Cumbria Integrated NHS as a nurse, a community nurse working only two days per week. Um, she has three children, two of whom are disabled, and she had been told that she would have to now comply with new flexible working requirements. And when I talk about flexible working requirements, that is, of course, the employer NHS wanting employees to be more available. So, i.e., they wanted their nurses to be available to work weekend shifts, which was a new imposition of a change, which, of course, means it's a PCP, a provision criterion or practice, which triggers potential for indirect discrimination. And in this particular scenario, it impacted on um, Mrs. Dobson negatively and therefore kicked in indirect sex discrimination. So the question was, was it justified as a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim? And although the NHS were able to establish a legitimate aim being the need to provide a service during the weekends and that it would be appropriate to request all their nurses take a, a share or a, a, you know, take part in that rota so that not everybody was having the burden of that, the disparity on Mrs. Dobson was so significant um, and caused her so much disadvantage that it wasn't proportionate. So although they could tick the box of having a legitimate aim for introducing the, the rotor shift, weekend working, it wasn't proportionate in the way they did it and therefore her claim succeeded. That's now gone back for reconsideration to determine outcome. Next one. Again, childcare disparity considered in the Thompson and Scan Crown Limited. Now, Scan Crown Limited is actually an estate agent trading as um, more, I think, in London. Um, and Thompson, as you'll see from the level of compensation awarded to her, was on a significant salary as, as an estate agent working in the city of London, dealing with high net worth clients and high value property deals. Um, hence the values there on the screen, which are obviously unusual that we, we see. Now, she wanted to request flexible working and made an informal flexible working request during her maternity leave. And this was for her first maternity leave, her first child. And she asked if she could work at up until 5 p.m. rather than 6 p.m., which was her standard working hours. So she wanted one hour less and she wanted a four-day working week rather than a five-day working week. That request was rejected, and she then 
pursued it as a formal working request, flexible working request, with a grievance attached to it, again, her request was rejected. And so ultimately, she brought a tribunal claim. And again, the tribunal took judicial notice of the childcare disparity and decided that the rejection was unlawful, that they could have managed to accommodate that request. And therefore, you know, amongst other things, um, her claim resulted in that level of compensation. So again, just as a reminder to really consider carefully why and how you might deal with flexible working requests. And if you are going to reject a request, make sure that you can evidence the reasons for it, just to avoid these potential outcomes. Next case, Hartley. Now, this is one I've done a lot of talking about. So if you've seen me speak on uh, discrimination from September onwards, you may have heard me talk about this case. It's something that for those of you who've had me in-house to do your equality update training to your staff, I've talked about it. And so this is a case where we're in the Northwest um, and an HR manager of a funeral home was subjecting female colleagues to a number of um, discriminatory um, comments. And we'll talk about those. But what he was dismissed for were quite serious incidents. So he was dismissed for making reference to looking up a colleague's skirt, asking for vital statistics, and uh, making a joke. And it, this was a funeral home. Uh, one of his female colleagues was looking after a deceased baby, uh, which was obviously a very sensitive um, situation. And he had made jokes about things crawling up her legs and all of, you know, really inappropriate comments. And I won't go into too much more detail because you can just imagine, you can read the judgment if you want to, to have the full story. But as part of the judgment, the judge took notice of the fact that this particular individual regularly uh, and through usual discourse called his female colleagues various pet names, including honey, hun, babes, love, chick, sweet, sweetie, and various other types of pet names, which the judge wanted to make a particular point of saying are no longer acceptable within the workplace as types of references. Now, interestingly, it was held that those pet names are infantilizing and demeaning to women, and albeit might not necessarily always be intended to be negative or derogatory, just have that impact generally on reducing women's professionalism within society and the way that women are regarded. Now, the individual male who was bringing a sex discrimination claim saying, it's sexist for you to say that about me. So he was saying he was a victim of the Me Too movement. Now he said, I call men mate and lad, and that's the same. And the judge said, it's not the same. Because the word mate or lad isn't demeaning in its nature and wouldn't reduce the respect of men amongst the workplace. So interestingly, we've got pet names that are unacceptable here for use moving forward. Hun, particularly something I see a lot of. Um, something that, of course, as a woman, if we said to another woman, could also be deemed sex discriminatory. So just let's bear that in mind moving forwards as well. So the next one, Lakatus is a case where, again, here clearly, um, a fairly, fairly obvious one here, a male um, was accusing, women, sorry, not accusing, calling women birds. And the judge made the point of saying that nobody could possibly think that that would ever be funny, and was obviously directly sex discriminatory and an act of harassment. Um, and they also remarked that sometimes things are said ironically, but ultimately in the cold light of the employment tribunal room, in front of the judge, the press, and of course the world at large once judgments are published, which of course they all are now, these things can potentially seem rather different. And so it's important for us always to bear that in mind and make sure that we train regularly, forcefully, thoroughly, um, and, and of course ensure that our employees are aware of their obligations to each other and that reminds us of that statutory defence that we take all reasonable steps to avoid discrimination within the workplace. And here's a classic of example of why that's really important. Next one, 
ASDA. So this is a really key case for those of you who have been following the equal pay um, case updates, and this is an equal pay claim where predominantly female um, workers within the stores and the retail outlets were trying to compare themselves with predominantly male workers in the distribution centres at different sites, and it was held here that um, although both, workers were set, both sets of workers were at different establishments in terms of location because they had one common employer and therefore the, the terms of employment came from one common source, they were able to compare themselves with each other if they're able to establish that the work is of equal value. So that provides quite a clear um, test now for equal pay claims moving forward. So swiftly on to disability discrimination cases and really one of the most noteworthy cases this year is the case of Rooney and Leicester City Council and an employment appeal tribunal has overturned a tribunal's decision and in this case the tribunal had decided that a female who was suffering from perimenopausal symptoms and of course also menopausal symptoms um, which included insomnia, fatigue, tiredness, lightheadedness, confusion, stress, depression, anxiety, palpitations, memory loss, migraines and of course hot flushes, the tribunal held that was not sufficient to equate to a disability for protection under the Equality Act. The EAT have reviewed that and overturned that decision and sent this case back to the tribunal for proper um, consideration of the merits of whether or not, having now been held to be disabled, um, whether this employee has an actual um, case in terms of the merits of her claim. And this is just one case that highlights the emergence of claims relating to menopause within discrimination at the moment. And so, again, for those of you who've been following the news, there's been a lot of campaigns out there, including um, the Women and Equalities Commission, who have been gathering evidence uh, and were awaiting their final report following their, their consultation in relation to their recommendations about workplace practice, and in particular, how to ensure that we are appropriately providing for and protecting women who are going through perimenopause, or menopause, and of course not just women in fact, because there are other categories of workers including males who've gone through um, gender reassignment and transgender individuals who have taken hormone replacement therapy, which also could potentially trigger menopausal symptoms as well. So at the moment the Equality Act, as you know, doesn't have menopause as a protected characteristic in its own right. but. One of the things that they're considering, and obviously we'll wait for the report, is to decide whether menopause should be a protected period in the same way that pregnancy and maternity is. Because at the moment, employees have to either establish it's discriminatory because of age, or sex, or disability. And I'll let you think about whether or not that sits well with you, as well as, as with um, the courts. There's also a case that's just come out this month, Best versus Raw, which is a company that produces pet food, raw pet food. And um, in that particular case, it was also held that um, there had been discrimination on the basis of menopause. And so there are more and more cases coming out, testing and developing this area. Next one. This case was brought against Fox's Biscuits. Trading is obviously the, the corporate name is Brand FB Limited, and it's now known as Northern Foods Group. And um, they employ. Uh, or employed Mr. Dytowski, who had been um, employed for a number of years before he was subsequently diagnosed with diabetes and became an insulin-dependent diabetic um, from March 2018. Now, in the period where he was just being diagnosed and his, his pancreas was still slowly working, albeit not functioning properly before it stopped working entirely, um, he had fluctuations within his uh, blood sugar readings and that affected his ability to control his, his blood sugar le levels, which in turn affected his emotional um, state of mind and caused a number of aggressions with an, an aggressive outburst within the workplace. And when that happened, um, he basically um, had a, a, an incident where he had threatened another member of staff and it became physical, although there's varying different events, versions of events of what actually happened. And in this case, again, the tribunal took what we, we've discussed as judicial notice of the fact that 
It is a phenomena that those who have diabetes can, if their blood sugars are not maintained and managed in an appropriate way to the point that they have a, uh, a normal range, if they go outside of the normal blood sugar range, which is four to seven, and they either go dipping into a hypo, which is low, or a hyper high, then of course that can, that can really affect their emotional state. And in this case, lots of evidence was, was held to be known that it can affect aggression levels significantly. Now, he'd been dismissed for this incident by his employer, Fox's Biscuits, and it was held to be unfair and an act of discrimination arising from disability because what they hadn't done was appropriately consider medically the appropriate level of medical evidence to assess whether there had been some form of um, mitigation from that perspective, but also whether, with the appropriate help and support, they could have assisted him from preventing that happening again. Next case, Stott and Raleigh. So in this case, we have a law firm. There's always a law firm in my updates, and this is it this year. So uh, we have a law firm who um, employed a paralegal who was dismissed within the first three months of her probationary period um, for errors. She made lots of errors, and even though her work was uh, marked and supervised and sent back for corrections with explanations as what needed to be remedied, those remedies weren't done properly, and so it had to go back again and again, and in, uh, basically there was just insufficient progress and development in order to continue with her employment. So her employment was terminated in her probationary period. On the day she was dismissed, without notice, pay in lieu, um, the night she got home, she sent a barrage of emails, lots and lots of different grievances, all in the one day, to various partners within the law firm, alleging that her dismissal was in fact disability discrimination because she suffered from anxiety, depression and various other conditions that she wanted to be made known of. She then brought a claim for disability discrimination, but particularly focused on the dismissal rather than what happened afterwards, because it was only afterwards that she'd been clear about her diagnosis. And ultimately, the, they decided that because the complaint was about what happened prior to and on the date of dismissal, the, or the law firm didn't know or had no constructive knowledge of her disability. But had they had the complaint been better worded and perhaps more cleverly written, and dealt with what happened afterwards as a, a different type of claim, the outcome could have been potentially different. So I suppose the moral of this story really is, although this decision went in favour of the law firm, it was because the claimant hadn't widened the scope of her claim to cover what happened after her dismissal, i.e. they didn't take her back when they were aware of her, um, out, her particular disabilities and whether or not they should have considered those in light of the um, the knowledge at grievance stage after dismissal. Next one, X versus Y. A very quick one, fear of catching COVID um, is the alleged protected characteristic here as a protected belief system, and so that failed. So the, the claimant said, I was dismissed because of my protected belief, which was fear of catching COVID. And although the judge said, absolutely, we're all you know, fearful of um, the potential physical harm or effects of COVID, and it was something to be respected, it wouldn't meet the necessary criteria for a protected philosophical belief in its own right. However, this case is slightly different. Um, this is the case where you'll have all have heard of this um, that gender critical views um, are protected as philosophical beliefs under the Equality Act. And this is a case that was um, very, very widely discussed, um, has very uh, many views, and made even more infamous by J.K. Rowling's tweets about it some time ago. Uh, so this claim is relating to a consultant whose contract was terminated and basically not renewed following her tweets that she made about um, gender um, critical matters. And she particularly states that gender um, is binary, it is a material reality and cannot be conflated with gender identity. So she wanted to um, express her views, and she did, and ultimately that lost her her contract. Now, the tribunal held that because of her absolutist view that were incompatible with other people's view of human dignity and the fundamental rights of others, she wasn't protected. That was then overturned at the EAT, where it held that a philosophical belief, even if 
it is something that other people might find offensive, is still worthy of protection, as long as it's not um, something that would be aimed at the destruction of rights, which they were able to, to, to look at what she was saying and say, it's not destructive, it's maybe offensive to some, but it's her view, and in fact represents UK law, as it currently stands. So, this case has now gone back to the tribunal and it is actually being held at the moment, well, it's, it's being heard in court at the moment this week to assess whether or not she was actually discriminated against because of her gender critical views. Um, again, social media is going wild about it and so if you want to follow the case, all you need to do is open your Twitter feed and it will be everywhere. Um, so we'll, we'll watch this space as to what the outcome will be very shortly. The next case is about a prison officer. And this is a reminder that employment tribunal compensation is unlimited for successful claimants in discrimination claims. Albeit it's rare to have significant long lost claims, this is one of those rare circumstances. And this case involved a prison officer who was subject to a sustained campaign of sexual orientation, discrimination, harassment. That included physical harassment and, and being beaten up and attacked by colleagues. Uh, when prisoners um, or offenders in the, in the prison where he worked also attacked him, the others stood back and allowed it to happen. There were other verbal issue, uh, comments and, and inappropriate bullying. He suffered victimisation when he tried to raise complaints, when he applied for a transfer to move to a different location, um, and ultimately his employment was terminated for trumped up um, purported allegations of gross misconduct. He was aged 38 at the time of his dismissal back in 2016, and his claims succeeded for all the areas of discrimination, and he was also able to establish that through medical evidence he won't be able to work again, or it's very unlikely that he'll be able to work again because of the impact on the way he was treated. So he was awarded the top band for injury to feelings, £41,000. He was awarded personal injury compensation of £18,000, aggravated damages and exemplary damages, totalling about 30 k in their own right. In addition to that, he was awarded career long loss to retirement age, and that is what's under... Um, appeal. And so the appeal um, tribunal held that it was absolutely okay to award career long loss in this case. However, there could be a discount applied for the fact that other circumstances can apply to life, such as an a, you know, unforeseen death or injury that would have potentially ended his career early. So there has to be some form of discount applied to that, and that's what has now gone back to court to assess. But that is a, an example of the really long and significant losses that can be claimed. And then back to JK Rowling again, although again, this is not a case against JK Rowling, but very much a case against the production company that filmed her TV adaptation of the Cormor and Strike novels, which she writes under the name Robert Galbraith, for those of you who are fans. Um, so Antonia Kinley is a, an actress, an actor who played Sarah Shadlock in the Strike um, programmes. And she was about to return for a reprise of series four um, of Strike, and she was pregnant. And so they, were, they replaced her with another um, actress who was actually recast and awarded a £5,000 more valuable contract than Sarah would have had. Sorry, not Sarah, um, Antonia. And so the production company ar argued that it was a genuine occupational requirement for their actors not to be pregnant performing this particular role because it would have been obvious. But the tribunal held that actually the £5,000 they spent on a different actor who'd been awarded a, a higher value contract for doing the same job um, would have covered the cost of maybe doing more um, clever camera angles to avoid any potential need to show that this um, actor was pregnant or could have gone towards any digital alteration necessary if it was true that they wanted to make sure that it wasn't obvious that this particular actor was pregnant, therefore affecting the storyline. So she was compensated for um, financial loss and injury to feelings and again, just a reminder that genuine occupational requirements are very narrowly interpreted on that one. So, some forthcoming updates. Macarith and DWP. 
So in this case, we're talking about pronouns. And again, you'll see lots of employers and lots of people are now using uh, preferred pronouns on their email signatures. And that's something that's very much now coming into common use. In this particular case, Macarith has refused to use pronouns that aren't gender critical, going back to the same argument of um, for stata. And in this particular case, which will be heard at the end of this month, um, they, the, the professor has said, um, sorry, the, the, um, the person has said that they, they will not accommodate or encourage a person's impersonation of the oppor opposite sex. That's their words, of course. Uh, and so that case is going to be held in March. So that will be one to watch. Another one relevant to those of you who have permanent health insurance policies and schemes for your employees, this is a case that's coming up for consideration in June this year, and that will be to address what happens where the PHI scheme ends at a particular age, in this case 65, but that actually the normal retirement age for the person has been set at a higher level, um, and is there something that needs to be changed in the law to accommodate that? And then a few other proposals. We've got pregnancy and maternity. There's a proposed extension of the time limit for women and new parents to bring claims um, after an alleged act of discrimination, an extension proposed of three to, to six months. Again, we're waiting for an outcome of that. In race discrimination, um, we have, um, at the moment, no requirement for ethnicity pay gap reporting. We've talked this morning about gender pay gap reporting and how large employers are required to provide that data every year. At the moment, it remains voluntary for ethnicity pay gap reporting. And because it's voluntary, less than, well, fewer than um, one in 10 large employers are actually um, providing that data. And again, there is uh, a lot of proposal, um, a lot of pressure on the government to introduce this. But at the moment, any bill that's gone forward hasn't made it through. So um, obviously, partly that will be because of other critical issues going on at the moment. But that's, again, one to watch this space. In terms of sexual harassment, um, we, there is a proposal to reintroduce um, third party harassment provisions that were in place, gosh, some time ago now, um, but were revoked. Um, and also a mandatory duty to prevent harassment in the workplace, which is obviously going to impose more preventative requirements for us. And then in terms of disability, um, there is a proposal for further support for disabled apprentices, and in particular, um, looking at the barriers faced by um, people with disabilities in undertaking apprenticeships and how we can address that to alleviate any disadvantage. And then finally, looking at socio-economic class. Um, again, lots of um, data out there identifying that this really does remain one of the most unprotected areas uh, where overt and uh, um, inappropriate discrimination takes place lawfully. Um, so, will we see legislation that introduces socio-economic class as a new protected characteristic? It's certainly something that the trade unions have been calling for and the Social Mobility Commission's report in 2021 has also called for. And if it was brought in, of course, we would see a huge cultural shift required in order to comply with legislation to reduce discrimination in respect of class and socioeconomic class. You know, would the words TOF suddenly become unlawful to use um, and that type of thing. So obviously, very, very important um, considerations there. And I said finally, but this is really finally. Um, there's lots of commentary now, articles and journals talking about the metaverse. It's not something I have ever participated in, um, but virtual reality where people create an avatar of themselves or of a, a new character, often overly sexualized apparently, um, are creating situations in the metaverse where other people are sexually harassing someone else's avatar and then raising complaints about it in the workplace. I know you're laughing. <laughs> However, people genuinely feel violated. So uh, um, what we need to think about is that moving forward. We'd only just got to grips with emojis, but here we go. So, <laughs> so that's me done. Um, does anyone have any questions on discrimination updates before I hand over to Helen?